When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. It's in the immediate aftermath of all we've seen in Gethsemane that the ultimate choices are about to be made. A choice on the part of Judas and a choice on the part of Peter. And so what we see in this second half of this week's lesson is meant for us to grapple with our lesser selves. Because what we hate about Judas is the fact that we recognize ourselves in him. And what we can't stand about a weak moment in Peter's life is that we have so many weak moments ourselves. As we now turn to the betrayal and the denials, can we think less about Judas and Peter and more about ourselves? Can we approach this with a Lord, is it I mentality so that we can actually learn something? And rather than sit back as armchair quarterbacks from the safety of 2,000 years distance, we wonder what would we have done if we'd been there in the garden in the darkness or if we were there outside Caiaphas' palace, how would I have responded to the pressures all around me? Because I do succumb to sin. I don't always resist temptation when the Lord has begged me to watch and pray lest I enter into it. That is betrayal on my part. Remember we talked about this at the Last Supper? It wasn't just Judas that ate bread with Jesus and then lifted up the heel against him. We all partake of bread with him at the sacrament. We all turn against him and walk away from him. How's that turning the heel on him? Or as Nephi said, not abiding his counsels, that is treading him underfoot, trampling him beneath our heels. Yes, we're the Judas here. We're the Peter denying our knowledge of Jesus. There's all kinds of reasons we come up with. We'll, perhaps, we'll wrestle with some of Peter's possible ones too. But turn with me now to the next verse in John. Since John gave us no time in Gethsemane before Judas came barreling in to betray. This is John chapter 18, verse 3. You remember 1 and 2? Jesus comes to the garden. And... Judas knew he'd be there because Jesus came there often. That ties in with what we saw in Luke. Luke told us that the Garden of Gethsemane was a place that Jesus was wont to come. He came there often. What John gives us in John chapter 18, verse 2, Jesus oft times resorted thither. And we should too. If we can oft times come unto Christ in that place, our valley of decision, if we can oft times repent of our sins and offer them to him where he will wash them away down the brook Kidron. We need to come here often. Well, unfortunately, Judas knew how often Jesus would come and felt that's probably where he'll be tonight. That's where I'll be with my army. And so they assemble. John chapter 18, verse 3. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Matthew and Mark say that Judas came right as Jesus was finishing the words to the other eleven. So there's no, no, no passage of time as we shift from one scene to the next. This is full drama, barreling ahead. Matthew and Mark also say, more specifically, that Judas brought a great multitude with swords and staves. So when John just says, a band of men and officers, Matthew and Mark say it was huge. It was a multitude. And when John says, lanterns and torches, okay, they're going to have to have some, some light, which is such an irony because they're there to capture the light of the world. Oh yeah, but they're bringing darkness with them. So no wonder they're going to need some light to identify light by. Well, we see torches and lanterns with John's help, but with Matthew and Mark, we see the specific weapons that John didn't list. They call them swords and staves. And a stave, like a staff, picture a club, what, think about this. Judas has brought an army with him. 
a great multitude, well armed. They got the torches and lanterns to be able to see what they're doing. They got swords and clubs to be able to frighten off the apostles and be able to take Jesus captive. Dead or alive? Well, I guess they want him alive, but they're prepared for the worst, it seems. Well armed. What's interesting to me is this gives us a glimpse into what Judas is expecting. Because to bring, I mean, you, we know how the story ends, right? No spoiler alerts needed. Jesus will, be, will go like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. If Judas had paid attention in Sunday school or Sabbath school, <laughs> synagogue, he would have known that verse from Isaiah 53 and not need it. He would have known, I don't need an army. Because was the army necessary? Not at all. Jesus surrenders himself and is led without, without raising a finger in his own defense. Judas, you totally misjudge the situation. What do they say? Don't bring a, a knife to a gunfight? Well, he brought no guns, they haven't been invented yet, but he brought swords and staves and an army. He must have been expecting as close to a gunfight as imaginable in the first century. But what did he get instead? No fight at all. I mean, we'll, we, you know this part too. There was a bit of a fight for an instant, but Jesus quickly, quickly calmed that one. He says, no, 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 lamb to the slaughter. But if what Judas got was the lamb, what he'd been expecting, it seems, was the lion. Picture this. For example, picture Judas so afraid of what Jesus was going to do. Here's a guy that can walk on water. Here's a guy that can command the elements. Peace be still in the middle of a storm. And I'm sure he could do the reverse and cause a storm that would blow us all away. Here's someone who can raise the dead. Well, can we even use death as a deterrent? I don't know. So it's all hands on deck. It's, get, it's rally the troops. It's get an army and arm them well. Because this is going to be a fight to the finish. Now, some have suggested, wait a minute, it, it, was Judas expecting that? Or was he hoping for that? I mean, did he know Peter well enough that, yeah, if anybody's going to jump into the fray, it's probably going to be him. Uh, and if we can start a fight, maybe that can ignite a messianic revolution. It, it does make you wonder, was Judas Iscariot a little like those multitudes, the 5,000 who had been had the loaves and fishes multiplied for them, and then came back and got the bread of, less, bread of life discourse instead of more bread? When Jesus told them, I'm not that kind of Messiah. I'm not here to free you from Rome. I'm here to save you from sin. And they all went away, and Jesus turns to the twelve, will you also? Was Judas, like, on the fence? Like, mm, maybe. But if we could just jumpstart an insurrection. I mean, it is Passover. You've got Jews from all over the diaspora here in town. You remember, you've got scribes and Pharisees and chief priests and, and people in charge of the Temple Mount scared to death of a riot because this is when the Roman legions are on high alert thinking if anything's going to go down, it's going to go down during the Passover season. And so if I can just ignite a spark, if I could light a match and throw it into the, the tinder box, then the explosion will drive out Rome once and for all. I, I want Jesus to be that kind of Messiah. And he seems so hesitant for some reason. He seems so, so gentle instead. Maybe he's biding his time now there's no more time to wait. We'll be, we'll be, will we be around for another Passover? This is our third one. We got to go. He keeps saying his time is short. Let's make it even shorter. And let's st start something. Is that what Judas is expecting? He has no intention of Jesus being killed. Instead, he, he wants a fight to start. And he wants Jesus to be on the winning side of it instead of the losing one, that's definitely a possibility. We'll see some possible 
confirmation of that, of that speculation in the way he responds later on. But even if, whether he's hoping for a fight, for Jesus to win, or hoping for a fight that Jesus will lose, he's expecting a fight one way or the other. And so, yes, he brings his army with him. It does make me wonder, did you miss the message these past three years? Have you been so focused on the power of Christ that you missed the personality of Jesus? You saw lion everywhere you looked and never learned to recognize the lamb. Are we guilty of that sometimes? Do, is it all shock and awe for us and we want more miracles and the kind of Messiah we are expecting instead of accepting the Messiah that has come? Oh, so interesting to try to get into the mind of Judas here. In the Matthew account of this, by the way, this is chapter 26, verse 48 through 50, we see what Judas now does. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign. In the Mark account, he calls it a token. So interesting. These are just going to be some signs, some symbol that lets you know something beyond the actual act. Okay? Signs and tokens can be used for positive things. They here can they be they can be counterfeited and used for negative purposes. But this sign, this token, Judas tells his army in advance, whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. Mark says, lead him away safely. Again, do you get that sense of, I'm scared to death of what's about to happen, what's about to go down? I mean, if Jesus can do anything, hold, hold his hands down. Don't let him raise them to the heavens to call down fire from above, okay? Lead him away safely. Hold him fast. I'm going to need an army to do it. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master. Is not the word that so often the scribes and Pharisees used? Master or Rabbi. It's kind of sickening to hear it on Judas's lips. Speaking of lips, after saying, Hail, Master, he kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Remember, wherefore is why. Why are you here? What's your real purpose? Is it to <laughs> begin a messianic revolution? Is it to betray me into the hands of sinners? Why have you come? What are you hoping for? Friend, so interesting he calls him that. It's the same word that the king used for the man without the wedding garment on in the parable of the marriage of the king's son. Friend, you could have been friend to me. Why weren't you? But with that betrayer's kiss, then came they, the army, and laid hands on Jesus and took him. In Luke's version, Jesus said, Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? So, shocked, amazed, astonished that that would be the sign or token you choose? Not pointing at me, but no, coming, drawing near me with your lips when your heart is far from me? Taking a sign of friendship. Maybe there was irony in what Jesus, the title Jesus gave to him. Friend, that's what friends do. A friendly kiss on the cheek. Un abrazo, as they say in Latin America. And that's how you get what you want? By some outward token of affection? Oh, that, even the way you phrase it like that should give us pause in how we approach people. And are we offering signs of affection Tokens of love, just because we want them to go along with our desires and do things our way instead of honoring them and their will and their individuality. Now, there's all kinds of problems. This is a messed up moment. And Judas is behind it all. Now, John's version of all of this is far more intense. We started with him, well, now we're going to come back to him. Matthew, Mark, Luke mention it, but it's more of a gentle, you picture the army there, that, that's, the pressure's on, Judas comes, gives Jesus the kiss. Whether he wonders if a fight or not, there's no fight, it's not lion, it's lamb, and they lead Jesus away. 
gently. In John's, there's a lot more drama going on. So in chapter 18, verse 4 and 5, here comes the army, lanterns, torches, weapons, and all. And Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, he's not surprised by this at all, he went forth. There he is, entering the lion's den, walking toward the army, not running away from it. And he said unto them, you can picture him kind of looking at Judas at the, out of the corner of his eye, but addressing the army, whom seek ye? And the army answers, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. So <laughs> Judas would have been able to point him out anyway. But no need. Jesus outed himself in the face of an army that for whatever reason didn't seem to recognize him. Was it the darkness of the garden? Boy, it should have brought more lanterns and torches. Was it that he looked so different than usual in this blood-stained robe, hair matted down against his face? Who is this? But Jesus coming to them, whom are you seeking? Uh, uh, Jesus of Nazareth? This is not what they're expecting. They're ready for a fight, and here comes somebody unafraid of them? He seems to be the master of the situation? Oh, yes, master indeed. Hail, master. And when they say, we're seeking Jesus? I mean, if, if you're looking for a way out, this is your time. This is your chance, Jesus. They don't know who you are. Do you point at Peter and say, well, there he is, and then you run? <laughs> no, that's not what Jesus is going to do. He identifies himself. No traitor's kiss necessary. And how does he do it? I am he. Or if you stick with the, the Greek itself, I am. Just like he said before the stones were about to come flying, when he, as he taught in the temple and said before Abraham was I am. This is Jehovah of the Old Testament. This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the God of the burning bush. <laughs> no torches needed. This is the light of the world. This is the great I am. And I am is standing before you. Is that really who you want? No wonder, verse 6, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, or back to the Greek, I am, they went backward and fell to the ground. Can you picture this played out before you? He's the one that should have been running. You've got an army against 12. 11 scared to death apostles, kind of still rubbing the sleep from their eyes. And then one man that is evidently suffering from blood loss, looks, does he have any strength to even stay standing? Oh, he's got all the strength in the world, it seems. Instead of him collapsing in the face of the army, it's the army that retreats in the face of the great I am. This is such an incredible moment. And then what happens? He's like, okay, it worked. Now hurry, this is our chance to escape. This is our chance to retreat, since they retreated first. No. Instead, it's a repeat of what just happened the first time. Then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. It certainly couldn't be that guy, because he seems so bold in the face of our, our army bearing down. But Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, if I'm really the one you want, and maybe this is why he was asking this from the very beginning, whom do you seek? If they said Jesus and all his apostles, ooh, okay, then we all would have had to go, or would we? Instead, it's like he tricked them with a beautiful question. Who are you after? Who is, who's listed on the arrest warrant? Assuming you went through the legalities of, of getting one. Uh, 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 Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, good. Because that's me. That's not these other 11. So the way he says, for their sake, if therefore ye seek me, then let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake 
Of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. I'm not going to lose anybody tonight. I'm not going to lose Peter, James, and John. I'm not going to lose Nathaniel and Philip and Thomas. I'm not going to lose any of them. They're mine. And so if you want me, fine, you can have me. But these get to go. So instead of using them as a human shield, he uses himself as the human shield and says, take me and let these go. This is a captain going down with his ship. This is a captain making sure everyone else gets on the life raft, knowing full well there won't be room enough for him. But that's Jesus for you. Now, Peter was having none of this. And in verse 10, then Simon Peter, and yes, he's both. <laughs> there's a Simon side, but there's a Peter side. And it's the Peter side. It's like Simon, he let fall asleep. But who woke up in the aftermath? Peter did. Full rock and all. He, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus, which I'm always fascinated by. In fact, John would bring that up. And yet, oh, Jesus always seemed to do. He knew the name of blind Bartimaeus and his dad's name. How's Timaeus doing, son? You haven't seen him. In, well, you've never seen him. Do you want to see him now? Jesus knows names, even the names of enemies, the names of servants of some false high priest. He's worth remembering. He's worth knowing by name. He's worth healing. Maybe Malchus wasn't there at his own will. He's a servant after all. And, whoa, 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 Peter, we're going, as, I'm going as a lamb to the slaughter. There's no need to try to slaughter any of the wolves that have come. Okay? So put the sword away, will you? It's interesting because Peter, in some ways, I think is felt at least fully justified in what he's doing. What did Jesus already said? Hey, if you got person script, bring him. If you don't have a sword, go sell a garment to go get one. Like, well, we got two, and if, there, if anybody gets one, I, I want one. Peter's all dibs on one of them. I'm surprised he didn't hold both of them, <laughs> okay? I don't know who got the other sword, but Peter's got one in hand. And you wonder, as he's awakened in the darkness, uh, shadows, you know, coming from, from the sides of the garden, and pretty soon, lanterns and the sound of rustling arms and an army here, and does Peter start reaching under his robes to get a grip on that sword? Does he silently unsheathe it, ready to strike? There's actually a fascinating detail in the Luke account of all of this. This is Luke 22, 49 and 50. When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? So they've got the question. I was like, they're, they're remembering too. He did say we were supposed to bring some. Is it go time? Is an army's now here? We're recognizing what we're up against. Is this why you told us to bring the sword? Are we supposed to smite? Can you picture them whispering? behind Jesus, kind of hoping that he can answer without the army hearing, so they can maybe start, the, the, get a jump on them, some kind of surprise attack. They probably don't, don't expect us to be armed here in the garden. And what's interesting about this moment, as soon as the word sword is uttered or whispered, the next verse, and one of them, we know it's Peter from the other accounts, one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. You good old Peter, jumping into the fray at the first mention of a fight. Bold, fearless. This is the strength side of his coin. We've seen the weakness side of it too. And remember those strengths and weaknesses are all part of the same coin. It's, it's heads, tails. It's the same attribute. And the things that we get frustrated about Peter putting his foot in his mouth is because he was willing to open his mouth and just jump in uh, whether or not he was prepared for it. It does seem really true to his personality. That even before Jesus answers the question, they're all, hey, should we fight? And, and Peter's all, fight, fight, okay, we're going. And <laughs> Peter, what are you doing? Now, imagine the, the moment, the intensity, the drama of the moment. You've got an army who's coming because Judas has probably told them, we need to hold them fast and take them away safely. And I, do we have enough weapons? Do we have enough men in this great multitude? You got the apostles on, on edge with sword in hand and ready to go. Jesus seems to be the only one who's the master of the situation. And he's calm as a summer's morning. 
silent as a sheep before his shearer. But all of a sudden, it's, the silence is broken by the shriek of pain by one man who's clutching his ear and blood is running down his face. And it's right then, you can picture everyone frozen but ready to leap into action. I remember as a kid, it's a horrible example, but we'd been at this, it was called Boys State, and they take the seniors from all these different high schools in California and brought them all to Sacramento to kind of play out what would it be like to run the government. And I was voted to go to this thing, and I'm not interested in politics much, but I was like, oh, it'll be an interesting experience, I'll go. Well, I had heard horror stories that all week long, people had been preparing for a food fight our last day. We were at a college campus and we're living in the dorms and having a great experience learning about politics and government and so on. And I'm like, we're going to do a food fight? Are you kidding me? That's, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. But I remember being at the last lunch in the cafeteria at this college and, and everyone was on edge because the rumors had spread. And I was like, is anybody going to do this? Well, I remember, I think it was the pudding cup heard round the world because somebody threw an open pudding cup. It was like high ceiling cafeteria and it flew across and then splattered on a table on the other side of the, of the cafeteria and chocolate pudding went everywhere. People getting, you know, pudding shrapnel wounds. And, and then it was silence and nobody moved because it was like, is, is this really happening? Is it, are we throwing down? Is it go time? And I guess everybody decided, yes, it is. Because the one shot, the moment of <gasps> anticipation, like everyone inhales and then boom, full speed ahead. I just remember diving under the table. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I didn't want to be part of the problem. I dove, dove under the table. It was like stop, drop and roll or like uh, get, get, get in, in, in safe position and then all heck broke loose. And there was pudding and yogurt and sandwiches and, and milk cartons and it was a, a massive mess. And yes, we all got incredibly busted as a result. Uh, this was the Boston Tea Party when they had expected good, good citizens to, to be ready to, to hold the reins of government at some point. Okay, Maybe that's why California is such a, such a mess right now. <laughs> no offense, my fellow Californians. Anyway, to understand the moment here and what do we do with that one act and Peter's ready to go start slicing through the rest of the army and the army's ready to go swarm on everybody else and lead Jesus away safely. Well, what does happen? Master of the situation, Matthew 26 verse 52, then said Jesus unto him, to Peter, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Is that really the way you want to go down, Peter? If you want to trust in the arm of flesh, so be it. They have more flesh on their arm. <laughs> we got an army of 11 and, I'm, and one of them is not going to fight? That's me? Yeah, take on a well-trained army with two swords. No. Now, if you want to trust in a better sword, the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Word of God, then yes, put your trust in that, and you'll win by that one. But if you want to fight by a temporal sword, you'll perish by a temporal sword. He then says to Peter, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? I mean, a legion... Oh, depending on who you ask, some number at 5,000 soldiers, others number at 6,000 soldiers. Either way, get 12 legions of angels. Angels that would be immune to mortal weapons. In some ways, I'm getting a flashback from Jesus at the top of the temple 30, or excuse me, three years ago when Satan quotes the Psalms and says, hey, leap off because surely the Father will send angels down to save you lest you smite your foot against a stone. Well, how about being smitten by a Roman army? or a, a Jewish one, or a mixed multitude, whatever Judas was able to assemble. Surely the angels will come. Well, Jesus knew that they could, but he'd already asked three times if there was some other way, and there wasn't. And so he meant it when he said, nevertheless. 
he, his will was fully to do the will of the Father. So, uh, Peter? <laughs> Angelic hosts. I am the Lord of hosts, after all. And hosts means armies when it's used in the Old Testament. I'm the Lord of armies. I didn't call anyone to attention. I've got troops. The more the, those that be with us are more than those that be with them. But I didn't, I didn't sound the charge. <laughs> and you're cutting off ears? <laughs> oh, Simon. I don't know if your aim's off or if you've... Have you ever used a sword before? You should have brought your nets from fishing. You could have caught a whole multitude. <laughs> but you cut off an ear. Hmm, interesting. I picture Simon feeling really sheepish right now. Like, uh, again, everyone else is arm, you know, sword in hand, ready to fight, and, and he's kind of tiptoeing backwards, retreating, and, and, and with tail between his legs, like, uh, sorry about your ear, man. Um, <laughs> and sorry, Jesus, for my lack of faith. What Jesus does next, Matthew 26, verse 54, he continues speaking, preaching. He says, how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? Jesus knew his scriptures. He'd read his patriarchal blessing. He knew how Isaiah 53 ended, and he was here to fulfill it. Jesus had long known it had to be this way. He didn't shy away from it. He certainly wasn't going to do it now. I love that phrase, thus it must be. And then Matthew says, in that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes. So now he's addressing his enemies. Are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? By the way, thief here is better translated bandit or brigand, some kind of insurrectionist, which is either what Judas was hoping he would be, or what the army was afraid he would be. Either way, it's what Barabbas actually was. He really was an insurrectionist, a bandit, a brigand, a thief. Well, Jesus goes on, I'm not any of those. I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. Luke then adds this interesting phrase, but this is your hour and the power of darkness and then Matthew ends, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples forsook him and fled. As prophesied, the shepherd was about to be smitten and the sheep were being scattered. Jesus had told them to. He said, if you're after me, fine, then take me, but let these guys go. And I'll stand, I'll, I'll occupy the army. You guys retreat, get out of here and live on. Live to fight another day and fight with the arm of God, not the arm of flesh. Go and wield some real swords. Two metal ones is not enough. But spirit and word, you've got this. If we think back to what Luke added, though. In the Savior's words, ah, no wonder you're coming now. This is your hour. This is the power of darkness. I'm surprised you even brought torches and lanterns. Because darkness seems to be your element. No wonder you never arrested me during the light of day. You had plenty of chances. I taught in the temple all the time. I wasn't trying to hide. No. But I guess you were. Hmm. It seems to suggest that this arrest points to your guilt more than mine. The fact you would have to do it this way lets me know that you know you don't have a legal leg to stand on. It's so interesting what Je Jesus is turning the tables as always and points out to them, if this were a legal arrest, you've had every opportunity to do it. But no, you fear the multitude. Yeah, I've heard that. You want to take the light of the world under cover of darkness because this is your time of night. Well, fine. I'll go, but let these go. And they do. They all flee. Luke then adds this detail in chapter 22, verse 51. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. So is he speaking to the army? Is he speaking to his apostles? Suffer ye this 
thus far. In other words, it has to be this way. Just let it happen, okay? Peter, put your sword away. All of you, get out of here. Army, you can put your swords away. There's not going to be a fight tonight. I will come willingly. So suffer ye thus far. And speaking of suffering in a literal way, I can see that this man is Malchus, right? That's, that's the name? Yeah, servant of the high priest. I, I, I love servants. I love everybody, including you. So come here. And he touched the ear and healed him. The only blood that was supposed to be shed that night was Jesus's. And talk about an irony. A man who had just bled from every pore reaches out his blood-stained hand to stop the, the bleeding from a mere flesh wound. Imagine how Malchus feels after that. Is he recognizing the light of the world there in the darkness? Is he wondering, I'm servant of, high, of the high priest, but no, this is the real high priest of good things to come. We saw this last week when it's Jesus' heart that most deserves to be troubled, and yet what does he say? He comforts those around him. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Here, he's the one suffering, and yet he heals someone suffering infinitely less than he was. And we'll see that over and over and over throughout, the next, throughout this night and into the next day. Jesus losing himself in service to others and finding himself as a result. The John version of all of this then ends with this. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And by now Jesus knew full well that he would. Peter, I asked three times. And there's no other way. Thus it must be. There's no turning away the bitter cup. There's no sending the army of angels. My foot is about to be dashed against the stone. But don't forget, it's that same heel that crushes the serpent's head. Let it go. Let me go. Thus it must be. And with that, the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him though they didn't need to. Jesus was already bound. His will was bound up in the will of God. He didn't need worldly ropes to keep him at bay. No, I will go with you. And so he does. Mark then includes this really strange detail, only found in the book of Mark, chapter 14, verse 51 and 52. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And that's it. And you have no explanation. You're like, wait, what the heck was that? And Mark, why on earth would you include that? Huh? Some naked guy running around? What? Okay. Now, first of all, calm down. Naked hardly ever means completely in the nude in the scriptures. Typically it means not having your robes on, your outer clothing. You still have your loincloth on. You still have your undergarments on. So that's most likely what th this guy was probably asleep or in bed and just sleeping in his underclothing. And then he hears some commotion. Maybe he lives really close. This is the tricky part. We don't know who this person is. We don't have any, it's all speculation. We don't know any details. All kinds of people have made suggestions. Some have suggested, is this Mark? And this is his way of including himself in the narrative. And so it's only in the book of Mark, and he brings, him, brings himself in this way. It's like John in his gospel saying, the apostle that Jesus loved. Well, that's a way better way to do it than Mark going, the guy that was running around in his underclothing, okay, I guess it could be Mark. Others have said, could this be the rich young ruler? And was he trying to follow Jesus from a distance and see what was going on? And, and he had this linen cloth. I'm like, really? Oh, okay, I get possible, whatever. Some have suggested, and again, all of these are speculative. Some have suggested this is Lazarus. I mean, Lazarus lived in Bethany, and that's really close to the Mount of Olives. And so, and some have even suggested, this is where speculation really gets to the extreme. They're like, ooh, and what was the linen garment? It was probably his burial clothing, and he'd kept it as a souvenir 
And so he always had it with him and he was running to be close to Jesus. And, and he leaves this in his hands as a reminder, like you are the resurrection and the life. You got this, you can do this and I'm out of here. Ooh, that's actually sounds fascinating. This was fan fiction, um, but we don't know. Glad you're a fan, but that might be fiction. For all we know, it's just some guy that lived close and heard the commotion and run out, of, jumped out of, out of bed and grabbed the sheet that he was sleeping in and wrapped up and then went to see what was going on. The JST does say that he was a disciple. Hmm. So at least we know he's on the Savior's side. How much of one was he just out on the, on the Mount of Olives asleep because it was Passover season and there was no room in the inn? Uh, was, he, was it curiosity? Was it courage? What was motivating him? I don't know. The JST also makes another interesting detail. It says that the young man, singular, laid hold on him. Where the King James says the young men, plural, laid hold on him. In the King James Version, it suggests that it's the army that grabs this guy. Like, who is this guy running around with a, with a sheet? Is this a ghost? What's going on? And they grab the, the sheet, uh, the cloth, and the young man, singular, <laughs> leaves the, the, clo the cloth in the hands of the young men, plural, and he's out of there, running away half naked. But in the JST, if the young man, singular, laid hold on him, you see, who's him then? In the King James, the him is the young man himself. In the JST, the him must be Jesus. That this young man, this disciple, comes running in and lays his hands on Jesus. It's almost... You get a sense there of a disciple wanting to be as close to Christ as possible. And what do we do? I don't have a sword. Do I, can I help in any way? I wish I knew more about this guy and what was motivating him. But when all was said and done, laying hold on Jesus, maybe with just the look in his eye and realizing, you know, Jesus is going as a lamb to the slaughter. And he leaves it in his hand and runs. Either way, whatever the reality might be, since we don't know, I do think the symbolism is beautiful. That here comes someone in the darkness seeking the light of the world. Here comes someone who is covered, but in reality, underneath, he's still naked, quote-unquote, uncovered. And if Jesus ends up going to the enemy and is overcome by them, then I have no hope to be covered at all. I will be fully exposed to the all-seeing eye of God, fully exposed to the demands of justice, fully exposed to my own enemies that will prevail over me. No wonder he comes and tries to lay hold on Jesus. You're the, whole, you're the only hope of covering I have. He who covers Adam and Eve in their nakedness with a coat of skins. He that covers us all with his atoning sacrifice. If we want to be fully covered, the only hope we have is to come into Christ. Otherwise, we will run away in nothing but our underclothing. Well, whatever happened then, we next see a sneak peek at Friday morning. This is in the, or at least we're going to take a sneak peek, okay? Because here we're still in the darkness and Jesus is going to be carried off captive, bound, to be brought before the high priest, or quote-unquote high priest, I should say, since he really deserves the title. For our sake, though, can we just quickly jump ahead to Matthew 27, 1 through 10, or 3 through 10, really? Because this is the aftermath for Judas. Because it's here, Jesus is brought away by the army. And it kind of leaves Judas, is he standing there alone? It doesn't say that he follows the army back with Jesus. Like he's done his job and, and is he left in the shadows? All alone, wondering, what have I done? We don't hear anything more from Judas until Matthew 27 begins. And Matthew gives us this brief account of the aftermath of the betrayal. And let's get, take, let's get it taken care of now, and then we'll leave Judas behind. And we'll follow Jesus to Caiaphas' palace. We'll see Peter and John with him, and that's where we'll finish our, our lesson today. 
Uh, trigger warning, by the way. This is, the aftermath includes a suicide. So if you, uh, if this is a, a topic that you just cannot listen to, then please skip ahead to the next part of this lesson and we'll be, we'll be with Jesus at Caiaphas Palace. But for those that can sit in the moment and listen to what, what Judas does next, this is Matthew 27, verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned. So this is, again, we have to fast forward to get to this moment. Jesus has already been through the Jewish trials and put, keep trials in quotes because it's a mock trial start to finish. He realizes that, oh no, it didn't work. The, uh, if, assuming he was trying to foment some kind of rebellion and jumpstart an insurrection, it didn't work. I thought Jesus was going to fight. He, no, what? He's condemned? This is not what I wanted. Because what happens next? When he saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. The JST adds, thy sins be upon thee. You see what they're doing? They're washing their hands of this. And now realizing there's no going back, what does Judas do? He cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. The JST adds, on a tree, and straightway he fell down, and his bowels gushed out, and he died, which is really a disgusting description here. It's important, though, because it reconciles the account in Matthew to a later flashback in the book of Acts that seem irreconcilable, as if they were, there's some kind of discrepancy in Scripture. And, and Joseph helps solve that discrepancy by inspiration. You see, in Acts chapter 1, verse 18, when the apostles gather, the 11 survivors come together to try to decide where do we go from here, and they fill the vacancy in the Quorum of the Twelve. Speaking of that vacancy, this is what Peter says about the one who left it. Acts chapter 1, verse 18, Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Again, disgusting there. But the confusion that has resulted is the Matthew account, he hangs himself, commits suicide. In the Acts flashback, it seems that he's, I don't know, running away and he trips and falls and ends up disemboweling himself somehow as he, split, as he hits the ground. Uh, according to the, J, the JST, it reconciles those two accounts and lets you know that, that they both happened in succession that he hanged himself upon the tree, but then the body fell. How long had it been on the tree? Had it, would it been just been left there? You're not supposed to, but this man seems cursed, and it's a festival of Passover, and so let's not mess with it now during the festival. Let's just wait. And by then, again, uh, let your mind wander, but has it swollen? Is, does it fall? Then the, ugh, it just, it's disgusting. But many a uh, commentator has said, well, it's Judas, so make it as horrific and horrifying a death as you can make it. Uh, be, in all of its disgusting detail, Judas deserved it all. Well, did he? It seems... Oh, suicide is such a hard topic to discuss. And usually it is attempted or committed by people who feel there is no other option. And life has become so unlivable. And there's no hope for anything better on this side of the veil. That they end up crossing the veil at their own decision. Oh, well, there's contraries to be proven there. And and where we offer justice and where we offer mercy, and that's a conversation for another day. But in Judas's case, the conversation for this day is, was he a son of perdition? How do we pass judgment on him? Was he right to do this? And if he hadn't, then God would have done it anyway, and, and you're beyond redemption. And so as disgusting a death as you can paint for it, go, go ahead and paint, paint away. Now, on the one hand, it tells us a lot about Satan. 
if it was Satan that entered into Judas, remember we saw that detail in the Last Supper accounts, takes the sop and Satan flows in right along with him, he digests him as well. And so it's the adversary that's trying to orchestrate this. Well, how does Judas end up for his diligent service to the prince of this world? Does he get promoted? No. He gets punished. Do you remember at the end of Alma 30 when you meet Cor you've met Korahor, an incredibly successful servant of Satan? But what's the, what's the end story for him? He also suffers a horrifying death trampled underfoot by people that, sadly, kind of believed like he did. But there's no loyalty among Lucifer's ranks. Now, how does Mormon look back on that and say, thus we see? Well, his takeaway is Satan does not support his children at the last day. Oh no, he drags them speedily down to hell. And that seems to be the case here with Judas. What? Think about the, the elders of the, of the Jews and the chief priests. And Judas did them a favor. Remember, I came to you. I offered my services. In one of the accounts, I didn't even ask for anything, but you offered to pay me, and I took it. But I don't want it anymore. I, I kept my receipt. Can we just cancel the order and say it never happened? I don't want to have anything to do with this. Here's Judas trying to wash his hands. Well, they've already washed their hands of Judas. So forget it. It's on you. <laughs> you see to that. <laughs> oh, too late, buddy. We used you. And you were more than willing to be used. So it's all on you now. And feeling there was no hope for him, he went out and ended things. Yes, Satan does not support his children at the last day. But that still doesn't answer the question, was he a son of perdition, though? Perdition, with a capital P, would be Satan himself, right? Perd perdition means the lost one. And no one was more lost than Lucifer. Sons of perdition, those that fully follow him. It's like father, like son. They want family resemblance on that side of the family tree as well. Well, was he? I know that Jesus used the word son of perdition before. I've kept them all. I've only lost, the only one I've ever lost is the son of perdition. Well, was he talking about Judas there? With a, a betrayal quickly to come? Or was he talking about Lucifer there with a betrayal that had happened eons ago in pre-mortality? He's the one I really lost that I was hoping to save. I don't know. But if you take the definition of a son of perdition, I really struggle to see how Judas fits the bill. For definition, look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, then it's impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now take all of those criteria and see how many of them apply to Judas Iscariot. They were once enlightened. Well, I would hope that he was enlightened. Three years of following the Savior, that would be pretty enlightening, wouldn't it? Tasted of the heavenly gift, I would assume. But then again, maybe he was, I don't know, just looking at the fruit and squeezing it and thumping it and smelling it and not actually partaking of it. I don't know. Partakers of the Holy Ghost... Mm, he's felt the Spirit, I'm sure, but to receive the gift, that hasn't been an option yet. The, that comforter won't come until Jesus first leaves, right? Or what about this one? Tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come? Again, I don't know. Back to our experience in the garden, had Judas missed the boat these last three years? Had he only seen lion and never seen lamb? Had he fo focused on power at the expense of principle and personality? Was he still missing something? It seems like it, especially based on the aftermath. Because once he comes to himself, this prodigal son, and comes rushing back to a wrong father and brother, uh, saying, I, I, do over. Okay, undo, undo. I, I don't want to have anything to do with this. And they're like, it's your problem. Keep the money. And he can't. He won't. He throws it back at them. 
I want nothing to do with this. And now that it's too late to go back, what have I done? I can't change. I can't reverse the effects of my decision. It's over for me. And he ends it all. That doesn't sound like what we see at the end of Hebrews 6, verse 6. They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. It wasn't an open shame that Judas was seeking. It was behind the scenes. It was under cover of darkness. And crucify him afresh? That means do it again? That's a son of perdition. The way Joseph Smith described it, it's like staring into the sun and denying that it's shining. And to couple that with these words here from Hebrews, imagine the Son of God resurrecting, standing before you in all his celestial, sun-like glory. And you basically spit in his face and go, oh, I wish I could, if I could do it all over again and crucify you a second time, even knowing full well that you already rose from the tomb the first, man, if I could do it a second time and keep it permanent this time, I would. Wow, how's that for defiance? In section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants, when it describes sons of perdition, it says they don't just deny, they defy We're going to see Peter deny later today. He never defies. And we see Judas betray. But does he? Does he defy Jesus? He certainly doesn't try to put him. He doesn't try to crucify him afresh unto himself. No, once he realizes that crucifixion is what awaits Jesus, he wishes there were a way to stop the first one, not repeat it a second or infinite number of times. It does not seem that Judas qualifies as a son of perdition. As someone lost, certainly, but not like the lost one himself. Not that belligerent in his betrayal. In fact, Joseph F. Smith said this about Judas. That Judas did partake of all this knowledge, that these great truths had been revealed to him, that he had received the Holy Spirit by the gift of God and was therefore qualified to commit the unpardonable sin? That is not at all clear to me. To my mind, it strongly appears that not one of the disciples possessed sufficient light, knowledge, nor wisdom at the time of the crucifixion for either exaltation or condemnation. For it was afterwards that their minds were opened to understand the scriptures and that they were endowed with power from on high without which they were only children in knowledge, in comparison to what they afterwards became under the influence of the Spirit? I'm really grateful for President Smith's insight there. They don't, it doesn't seem like they knew enough. They hadn't received the Spirit. They hadn't fully partaken of things. They, I mean, remember, even Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. If the chief apostle still lacked conversion, then Judas... Was he acting at least in some degree of ignorance and admittedly wishing with all his heart he could go back and do things differently? You know, it does make me wonder about the ultimate result of of denying the Holy Ghost, that being the unpardonable sin. And what makes it unpardonable? Is it because God simply says, I will never forgive you? Or is it that the son of perdition says, I will never repent? Is it unpardonable because of God's choice or the person's? It seems that God constantly gives us invitations to come unto him. It's what Jesus had just suffered infinitely for in Gethsemane. And here, Judas, I wish you would have come. They wouldn't change anything, but I could. Imagine if Judas had run back to Jesus and expressed his own remorse, sorrow for sin. I was trying to jumpstart a revolution. I'm sorry. I wanted my Messiah. I, I realized I was wrong. I'm rethinking the last three years and recognizing who you've always been, and I, I somehow missed it. Is there any way we can save you from the cross? I'll grab a sword. I'll, get, I'll gather a new army. Can, if nothing else, will you forgive me? 
I beg of you. I'm sure Jesus would have. He said it already. Oh, you can deny me, and that's forgivable. Just don't deny the Holy Ghost. Don't stare into the sun. Oh, you haven't seen me in all my brightness quite yet, Judas. I would say there's hope, even for him. I certainly hope so, since there's a bit of Judas in me and in all of us. A few final details that Matthew's account then gives us. Verse 6, The chief priests took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. To me, it's so interesting to see the words of these chief priests. I don't know if there's a better example of what Jesus said back in Matthew 23 about scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Remember that one? I mean, a gnat would be an unclean animal, and I certainly want to, don't want to drink the floaties if there's a gnat in there. And yet they're choking down camels, thinking they're okay. That's what they're doing here. They have just paid blood money to Judas to betray and falsely accuse Jesus so that they can then send him off to death. It's blood money, and they fully know it. They admit it themselves. But, oh, it would be unlawful to use blood money to to put in the treasury. I mean, I wish we could, because then that would somehow line our own pockets. Uh, but no, 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 no. That's for rich people and widows with their, their mites, like they're worth anything. No, we can't do that. What, what are we going to do with this? You see what they did? They swallowed the camel of crucifixion, but they're straining out the gnat of unlawful temple donations since this happens to be blood money. Oh, this is, this is horrifying. Their level of rationalization and justification, their, their hypocrisy down to the core. They've got, they've got camels sticking out between their teeth whenever they show that wicked grin. So what are we going to do? Well, we'll just buy a field. And we'll be able to buy, we'll, we can bury strangers there. Now, verse 9 and 10, one last insight that Matthew gives us. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. So there's Matthew, as usual, bringing up every potential fulfilled prophecy from the Old Testament he can. And this is actually an interesting one. He quotes, he says it's from Jeremy the prophet, which is Jeremiah for short. And yet there's not a clear prophecy in the book of Jeremiah along those lines. There is the one from Zechariah 11 that we talked about last time, or two, I guess two lessons ago where Zechariah makes it clear that, yes, you're going to weigh my price, and it's going to end up being 30 pieces of silver. And Judas fulfills that to the T. But Jeremiah, what, what, what is this? In some ways, what Matthew is doing is he's fusing, it's kind of a mashup here, of Zechariah and Jeremiah, and seeing a fulfillment in the life of Jesus based on this, on this mashup. Because Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 6 through 9, talks about weighing money to purchase a field. In that, it's not 30 pieces of silver. It was like 17, if I remember correctly. And it was when Jeremiah was in prison and he's prophesying, trust me, stay in Jerusalem. Uh, If we'll just surrender to the Babylonians, all will be well. In fact, I'll prove to you that I have uh, a long-term view in sight by buying land. And if we're, I mean, if we're all going to be destroyed right now by the Babylonians, then there's no use in spending money to buy land. But if we'll surrender, and yes, carried captive back to Babylon, fine. I promise we'll be brought back. So this, this land, I'll eventually be able to settle on, or at least my descendants will. And so watch me. And he purchases this land from a relative. Uh, in fact, he redeems the land, is what it's called. Interesting. Uh, Now, what Matthew's doing is he's seeing what happens with Judas and this field of blood, and it's purchased for strangers, and he's thinking, oh, wait a minute. I mean, if you know your Old Testament well enough, like Matthew does, a Jew writing to fellow Jews, he's like, oh, this is an amazing analogy. It's uh, It's not specifically a prophecy being fulfilled, 
But talk about an interesting parallel that take Zechariah, and yes, there's fulfilled prophecy, but take Jeremiah, good old Jeremy. And man, Jesus is, he's redeeming land through the price of his own blood. I mean, I guess technically Judas is, well, technically, technically, it's these chief priests and scribes that are doing it. But isn't it amazing, Matthew seems to be suggesting, that even in being betrayed, Jesus is redeeming land for strangers. He's giving even outsiders who have no hope for some eternal resting place themselves, at least not in their own land, space is being provided for them in a local cemetery, right close to the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Ascension itself, close to the Temple Mount. What a place of honor to give these strangers an eternal resting place. It's amazing what Jesus can do, even when betrayed. He can turn ashes into beauty. And he can turn blood money, his own money from the blood of betrayal, into a resting place for those who have no place to rest. There's some beautiful symbolism there. It also helps you see how flexible Matthew felt he could be with Scripture and weaving allusion and analogy into prophecy and bringing Scripture together. It, it really was a beautiful gift that Matthew had. I'm grateful for it. Now, from Judas then, can we turn to Peter? And we'll shift from betrayal to denial. This is another sad story, and it's one that I hope we see ourselves in instead of just assuming the worst about Peter. Let's work on Lord is it I. But for this, we'll start with Matthew 26, verse 57. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. So you got an army in the field and you got an army back home. Okay, And this army of scribes and elders is there in the, in the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest. Let's take him to the Jewish authorities first. Now, then again, it wasn't straight to Caiaphas. John lets us know he went to someone else along the way. Caiaphas, yes, technically is the high priest, but Caiaphas's father-in-law was a guy named Annas, who was much older, but still held on to a lot of authority. Annas had been high priest earlier on. Annas would have been high priest during Jesus's childhood, kind of fresh back from Egypt. Uh, and he's up in the Galilee, but who's running the show down in Jerusalem? Well, Annas is. Now, eventually the Romans were probably a little concerned about Annas's power grabs, and so they're like, okay, this is just a, a puppet position anyway, because we won't touch Judaism with a 10-foot pole as far as your weird religious rituals and stuff. So we, we put a little puppet uh, to run the show, but, but we want a puppet that we can control. with. The, we want to hold the strings. And Annas isn't that kind of guy. So we're going to depose Annas, remove him from authority. And uh, who, who else do you want to be in charge? Well, the high priesthood went through five sons of Annas and then ended up in the hands of his son-in-law, Caiaphas. So you can still kind of see Annas behind the scenes working his, his magic. Can we at least keep it in the family? And when the sons were still too close to the action, well, fine, let's marry somebody in and we'll bring Caiaphas in. And I can still kind of <laughs> hold his puppet strings. How's that? Annas still wielded a ton of authority even though Caiaphas had been in charge for a long, long time. I mean, he ran the show in Jerusalem from, I think, like A.D. 18 to 36 or somewhere along those lines. So he was in charge. Caiaphas was in charge when Jesus was brought to the Sanhedrin. He was brought to the council. But Annas is still behind the scenes, and so the soldiers actually bring him to Annas first. And we see that in the book of John. So this is John chapter 18, verse 13. It starts. They led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So that's John's way of reminding us about a story that was told earlier. 
You remember when everyone's up in arms, like, how do we kill this Jesus? And, and Caiaphas is like, hey, calm down, guys, calm down. Don't you remember? It's, it's going to be feast time soon, and usually one person is going to die, and it's better that one person die than the whole nation suffer. Uh, so give it time. We'll, we'll be able to work this thing out. Uh, and this is John's rem reminding us of that. So Caiaphas is the one with the, you know, the ace up his sleeve, like, eh, we can stop a rebellion by getting rid of one insurrectionist. And let's make sure it's Jesus, shall we? Now, in verse 19, we're going to skip ahead and then come back to what we skipped. Jump ahead to John chapter 18, verse 19. The high priest, who wasn't actually the high priest anymore, but, you know, power is hard to part with. <laughs> the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Interesting that those be the two things on Annas' mind. Uh, what kind of stuff are you teaching? And are people actually buying it? Because we've got to see how far the water has gotten. At the end of every row, well, we're going to have to start plowing up the field. Who are your disciples? It's not enough to just cut off the head. We're going to have to cut off all the, the appendages as well. We've, stricken the, we've smitten the shepherd. Now let's go after the sheep. So tell us about your disciples. Tell us about your doctrine. Now Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. So why asketh thou me? Ask them which heard me, what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. I love what Jesus is doing here. We'll see more of this when he meets with Pilate tomorrow and Herod as well. But here before Annas, on the one hand, it's like he's saying, I, I don't have to answer to you. You have no authority. I know that. Neither does your son-in-law, though he technically still does. But this goes back to what he said there in the, in the garden, in the darkness, before the other army. Why didn't you, if you were going to arrest me, why didn't you do it in the light of day? Oh yeah, because this is your hour. You like the darkness. He's saying the same kind of thing to Annas. You'd, why are you asking me about doctrine and disciples? I did all of it out in the open. In fact, I think you're worried about my doctrine, how fast it's been spreading. I think you're concerned about my disciples because they're everywhere. A little late to end things, isn't it, Annas? It's so interesting to me to see Christ's control of the situation. He's the real high priest. He's the real authority. And he's standing before them in bonds. But one other thing to consider. When Jesus says, you want to know about my doctrine and my disciples? Well, let's go two for the price of one. Go ask my disciples about my doctrine. They'll be able to tell you. Jesus, in some ways, is leaving his defense in our hands. Rather than defend himself, he's asking his enemies, go ask my friends. Do we know Christ's doctrine well enough to defend him? Are we enough of a true disciple that Christ can trust us with his defense? I hope so. There's some more studying I want to do before I get ready for the court case. Okay? But I do want to defend the Savior who always defends me. Well, that's a pretty amazing answer. Although it's not the answer that Annas wanted and certainly not the answer that his little minions expected from Jesus. So verse 22, when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. And that's where we get back to where Matthew, Mark, and Luke were talking, where it's like, oh, yeah, it's at Caiaphas that he went. But no, Annas along the way. Can you see Annas, like now, is backpedaling, retreating, like, okay, God, I'm not in charge because this guy beat me and not be me beating him. In fact, beating him, beating him, why did you beat Jesus? Why did you smite him? Well, because he was talking smack to you. It's such an interesting moment here that it's disciples coming to the rescue of their masters. And here this officer, feeling like Annas just got offended, goes and smacks Jesus upside the head. He does it with the palm of his hand, notice. He didn't even think Jesus was worth a clenched fist. So it is more a slap, open-handed slap. Let's see who's, who's going to be offended here. 
And if you don't take Annas's office seriously, then we're not going to take anything seriously about you. And here comes the smack. But Jesus, again, mastered the situation. Nothing to defend himself, but simply asks this officer, if I've done something wrong, don't make this some kind of character assassination. You have no reason to slap me. If I've done something wrong, tell me what it was. If you have anything to say. Jesus is always master of the situation. If I've done something evil, bear witness of the evil. But since there's been no evil done, I'm simply saying you have all the evidence you've ever wanted. I guess you're admitting Annas can't provide any and neither can you. So what do you do? You just attack. Just like Annas and Caiaphas and, and Pilate and everyone else just wants to attack with no justification for what they're doing. Beware of those that can't give you reasons for their attacks, but simply want to character assassinate instead. A smite across, a slap across the face, as we saw here. Well, now, now the camera's going to shift from Annas to Caiaphas. Annas was just the, the puppet anyway. Caiaphas technically is in charge. It's got to go to his palace. But before we go inside, where we meet Caiaphas and his minions, let's figure out what's happening outside the palace. Because there's like all kinds of commotion everywhere you look. So go back to John chapter 18, verse 15 and 16. Those are the verses we skipped. And Simon Peter followed Jesus. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics, all say he followed him afar off. You get a sense that, yeah, Peter must know the danger here. He wants to get close, but not too close. I want to be there handy if Jesus needs me. I, maybe I still have my sword tucked away under my cloaks, but uh, not too close, okay, afar off. And Peter wasn't alone in this. So did another disciple. And you know how John was, <laughs> ever the, the humble writer. He never talked about himself in the first person. It was just this other disciple. So it's most likely John that's going along too. Peter and John are on their way. Now, that disciple, John, was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. It's like, oh yeah, we win him? You're with him? Okay, yeah, come on in. Now Peter, meanwhile, he stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. So like, are you watching this? You're picturing how this is unfolding? John gets let in. He's without his wingman, uh, or I guess he is Peter's wingman. So he goes back out and talks to the servant girl and says, hey, hey, he's with me. Can, you, can he come in too? And so Peter is now in Caiaphas' palace, just like John is. And I have a feeling this is exactly how Peter would have wanted it. He's willing to jump into the fray and cut off an ear when there's an army on the other side. He's not afraid of Caiaphas' palace. Bring it on. Lions, well, let me into the den. And he comes in at, with, with John's help. Then verse 17 and 18, Then said the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? And he saith, I am not. Now, there's the first denial. By the way, I am not is a perfect parallel, or I guess I should say a perfect perpendicular, to what Jesus had just said in the darkness of the garden. I am he. Who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. Well, you're looking at it. I am he. And here, Peter facing a servant girl, not an army. Who are you seeking? Peter, a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. It wasn't, I am he. It was, I am not. Now, what happens next? The servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Matthew adds to this, by the way, that Peter went in and sat with the servants to see the end. He wants to see where this is going to go. Jesus has been oh, surrounded by his enemies repeatedly. And he always seems to get out, get, get away from them. Remember when they wanted to throw him off the edge of the cliff in Nazareth and he just passed through the midst of them and went his way? How did he do that? I'm still trying to figure that out. Or when he said, before Abraham was, I am, and they picked up stones to cast them at him, and he's just somehow escaped from the Temple Mount with enough time to talk to this man born blind and heal him. Now, Jesus always seems to see the end, is the phrase Matthew used. And as far as Peter is concerned, oh, there's no end. There never can be. 
Jesus is going to get out of this one too. And I'm going to be here to see it. In fact, I'm going to be here to help. Just you wait. So, uh, servant girl. No, I'm not, I'm not with him, though I really am and want to be as close to him as I can. I'm, just, I'm not t technically denying him, by the way. Okay? This doesn't count as one of the three. Come on, I'm doing this for Jesus' sake. Okay? I'm certainly not scared of some servant girl. So don't put this, don't mark this down as one of the three. Uh, no, I'm here to see the end. And I'm certainly not going to out myself in the midst of all these <laughs> servants and soldiers and people here in Caiaphas Palace itself. I'm not going to out myself to a servant girl. No, I'm not, I'm not the guy you're looking for. Now we're going to come right back to see what Peter's going to do with a second and third possibilities. We, and again, no spoiler alert needed. You know the, this, the end of this story. But I also wonder if we're, we're going to allow for Peter's strength, but we also need to account for Peter's weakness. And I wonder if, as usual, he's overestimating his strength and underestimating his weakness. I'm guilty of that as well. Because where is he? He's following Jesus. Oh, that's good. Well, but if you've already been warned, you're going to deny Jesus three times tonight and... Of all the places it's likely to happen, it would probably be at Caiaphas Palace. I've sometimes talked with my own students and asked them, can you imagine if your patriarchal blessing warned you on a specific day, and it told you the day, you will break the law of chastity? Whoa, whoa, wait, what? That always gets their attention. Like, can you imagine if the Lord warned you that specifically, a major sin is going to take place on such and such a day? And I've asked them, what would you do on that day? And it's always interesting to hear their responses because they're like, uh, I think I would like lock myself in the closet somewhere and not tell anybody where I am. I'm not going to bring my phone in with me because then there, people have access. No, I'm going to mark that day. And from midnight till midnight next, I am in lockdown. And there's no possible way I can break the law of chastity. I'll say, oh, but what if there's this really cool party going on that night and all your friends are going and they really want you to come? Uh, no, 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 no. Definitely not a party because I might meet people. Um, uh, like, well, what if it was a date? Like, no, but by all means, I'm definitely not going on a date. But what if, I mean, you're a strong person and you know the law of chastity. You've always lived the law of chastity and your girlfriend lives in the law of chastity, or it's an, an LDS party, it's all member friends that are going to be there, and they promise you it's all above board, it's going to be fine. Would you go? And they're like, absolutely not. What, you doubt yourself? Well, yeah, a little. Enough to take it really seriously when somebody was that specific, saying you're going to commit this sin on this day. I'll just outlive the day. And I've outlasted the sin. Jesus had go, told him the day, this night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me thrice. If that's even a possibility, Peter, then what on earth are you doing at Caiaphas' palace? I think we must be much more careful and recognize our own weakness before we cavalierly, overconfidently, throw ourselves into harm's way. How does Paul say it? Avoid even the appearance of evil. Which doesn't just mean appearance as in things that look like sin, but how about appearance as in places where sin might appear? Places where temptation might lurk and wickedness rear its ugly head and I might fall prey to it. No, get out of those situations. I will go nowhere near the palace of Caiaphas, if there's a chance that I might deny the Christ. Well, in Peter's case, it's only been one, and it's just this servant girl, and that doesn't really count. I've still got, I've got wiggle room, okay? I haven't done it three times. But pause here and go back inside, okay? We'll leave Peter out in the courtyard. Matthew and Mark tell us that now Jesus is standing before Caiaphas. And we'll use the Mark account as home base. Chapter 14, verse 55. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. Matthew says they sought false witness. So they knew from the very start. Anyone, any false witnesses out there? I mean, they're looking for someone. They don't have, 
on what charges has this person been arrested? I mean, don't, don't, aren't there Miranda rights? Don't I get to know what the charges are against me? Well, no, we haven't found them yet. We haven't trumped them up because we haven't found enough false witnesses that can agree with one another. Well, they know from the start that falsehood is their only hope. Not even that is working, but they're going to keep trying. The account goes on. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. <laughs> so it's like, you guys are the dumbest liars I've ever heard. Don't you know that you're supposed to get together before you start telling lies so you can at least get on the same page so that your lies will match? Come on, even, even junior high school kids know that. But no, they can't get liars to agree with one another. So what's next? Mark says, there arose certain. And Matthew says, at the last came two false witnesses. So these ones must have been smart enough to at least agree on their accusation beforehand. These certain ones, these false ones. And they bear false witness against him. And we'll go figure. That's what they've been hired or found to do. And this is what they said. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. And within three days, I will build another made without hands. Okay. What is that supposed to mean? And then Mark adds, but neither so did their witness agree together. So even with that one, they still weren't completely on the same page. This is pathetic. This is a comedy of errors. Now, remember that the law of Moses required that by the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Uh, again, a chance for scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites to strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Well, let's, if the law says we have to have two or three, then let's find two. And let's try to get them to agree with each other on their trumped up false charges. Well, when they finally do, they're not in perfect agreement. And what they do come up with is some cryptic statement, not on anything Jesus did, but something they heard him say. So in some ways, they're just making Jesus an offender for a word. And they don't even understand the word. But it was something about destroying the temple. And he's going to then rebuild it. I don't know what that means. But the Romans are not going to like that, since that's like tearing down public property. The Jews aren't going to like that, because it's not just public property. It's the house of God. So, yeah, we definitely need to kill him for that. This whole thing is such a mock trial. It's such a mockery of justice. And here you have the law standing before you. The, law, the Lord is the Lord of law. He's the author of the law of Moses. And yet people are trying to get around it to get to him. Talk about irony. In verse 60... The high priest stood up in the midst. So this is Caiaphas himself rising to his full stature. He asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? You better have words for me. You you talk to my father-in-law. Why won't you talk to me? I'm the one in charge. (laughs) Well, Jesus saw no need or perhaps no purpose in defending himself. But he's standing there. Caiaphas is angry as always. Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he, Jesus, held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? In Matthew's version he asks, I adjure thee by the living God, and that's ironic since the living God is standing right in front of him, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Talk about a bait and switch. What were the charges? Oh, we hadn't found any yet. But once we grabbed you and brought you in, we found false witnesses that accused you of saying something about tearing down the temple. Do you have anything to say about that? And it's not that Jesus is pleading the fifth. He just doesn't even honor that false accusation with any kind of reply. Like I guess I could have said to you what I said to your father-in-law. Go ask my disciples. They'll defend me. But no, I'm not going to defend myself against, against you since you really have no ac- accusation to attack me with. And with that, Caiaphas baits and switches. The bait was bring him in. We're going to, we're going to turn him into an insurrectionist. And that doesn't, have, that doesn't have a leg to stand on. And so once Jesus is there, Caiaphas gets to, re- to the real question and demands an answer to this one. Are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? Are you the Christ that people have been expecting? Because if it is, it makes you wonder what, if Jesus answered, what's Caiaphas going to do? 
are you going to follow me if I say I am the Christ? If I am the Messiah, are you more, do you, are you demanding a specific type of Messiah? A military one? Do you even want me to overthrow Rome since it's Rome that's allowing you to have some kind of puppet authority? Whereas if Rome wasn't here propping you up, then I'd replace you with a real high priest of good things to come. Well, Jesus does answer this one. In the Luke account, Jesus answers, If I tell you, ye will not believe. And if I also ask you, ye will not answer me, nor let me go. So, in some ways, what's the point? The die has been cast. Are you really going to change your mind now? I don't think so. You're far past the point of no return. So what would my answer even mean? That's Luke's version. Mark's version, he has a different answer. Jesus says, I am. In Matthew's, it's thou hast said. Like, hey, you said so. You're asking if I'm the Christ? Well, answer your own question. I think you know. But Mark's is my favorite. I am. Because it's that same bold, I am that I am. It's that same opposite of Peter's, I am not. Well, Jesus, I am. And he goes on, And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Yeah, then you'll know what real power is. You'll know who I am and whose I am. You'll understand authority then. But it'll be too late for you. You've been misusing your authority all along. And tonight is perhaps your worst example of that unrighteous dominion that misuse of power and authority. In verse 63 of Mark 14, then the high priest rent his clothes. Can you picture him doing that just in mock horror? Oh, the, 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 the shame of it all, the blasphemy of it all. I can't believe this. And so tearing his, his regal robes, he saith, what need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. In the Luke version, they say, we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. Now, this is incredibly sly on Caiaphas' part. He'd make a great politician because he is seeking plausible deniability. He's washing his hands just like Pilate will do the next day. Because he's turning it back on the people. Well, you heard him. I mean, forget the false witnesses. They weren't worked out anyway. But this man out of his own mouth. So he's borne witness against himself. That's the only thing we need which, again, is illegal in the law of Moses. But what do you all say? I mean, you heard the blasphemy, didn't you? And then by involving them and letting them decide, oh, yeah, definitely, definitely blasphemy. Right, boss, right? Let's, let's condemn him to death. He's surely guilty of it. It's like, ah, okay, yes. I'm just going to defer to the, to the jury. I'm not passing judgment here. Hmm. So sly what Caiaphas is up to. Well, he leaves, them in, leaves Jesus in their hands. Not a safe place to be. Because in verse 65, some began to spit on him. Matthew makes it more specific. They spat in his face. Others began to cover his face and to buffet him and to say unto him, prophesy. And the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. Again, slapping him. He's beneath the clenched fist. In the Matthew version, when they taunt him, they say, prophesy unto us, thou Christ. Can you hear the, the sarcasm dripping off their lips? Who is he that smote thee? They're turning Christ's omniscience into some kind of parlor trick. You see, we can blindfold him and then we'll hit him and then ask him, who did it? Who did it? Did you recognize it? Oh, talk about injustice. Talk about not recognizing who stands before you. Well, they don't care. Some of this happens before the verdict of guilty is reached. Other it happens after. They don't, they don't care. They're having a field day at Jesus' expense. And who's the one doing it? Who smote you? That's the sad reality. In some ways, we all did. And Jesus doesn't have to name names and call out specific sinners because he knows we're all guilty of his death. That's why he came in hopes he could, all, he could make us all innocent of his blood. Well, if that's what's happening inside, let's pan the camera back out and switch back to the courtyard and see what Peter's up to. 
Now, all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, will all talk about this denial. We saw Peter deny the first time already in the book of John, this damsel who kept the door. Mark calls her one of the maids of the high priest. We saw Malchus, a servant of the high priest. Now we've got one of his maids. And in the Luke version of this, this is chapter 22, verse 56, it says she earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. And can you picture the earnest look? That's got to make Peter a little uncomfortable to feel like he's being stared at when you're trying to remain incognito. But this maid, she's just, eyes are peering through him and he's like, can you, <clears throat> where's John when you need him? Um, can you create a diversion? I got to get out from this, this maid's sight. Now, when she says this man was also with him, he denied him saying, woman, I know him not. So there's that first denial. In fact, the Matthew version, he denied before them all saying, I know not what thou sayest, which is softer than saying, I don't know him. It's like, I don't, I don't crazy woman, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, in the Mark version of that, it says that he denied saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. So again, it's kind of passing the buck and I'm not denying Jesus. I'm just saying, you're crazy and I don't know what you're talking about. But as soon as that happened, he went out into the porch. So he's trying to get away from this staring, earnest look. He goes out into the porch and the cock crew. And if that doesn't wake him up into a reality of what he's doing, I don't know what does. Then again, Jesus had said three denials and two times of the, of the rooster crowing. And so far, it's only one and one. As I said before, it, it certainly won't happen again. I'm out of the porch, I'm, I'm going somewhere else, or I went into the porch, excuse me, out, I'm leaving the, the scene of the crime. Um, I guess I was a little, I wasn't a far off enough, so I'm going to seek safer, safer pastures, and I'm certainly not going to deny Jesus. But then we see verse 69 of Mark 14. And a maid saw him again. Luke says it was after a little while. So maybe Peter's gotten his courage back up and it's like, ooh, that was close, but I, I got this, I got this. And some time passes, kind of lulls him back into a false sense of security. But then another maid sees him and began to say to them that stood by. So now there's going to be other people. It's not just going to be a one-on-one -on -one denial. There's others. And she says to them, this is one of them. Now, in Luke's version, it's not a maid, it's a man. And the man addresses Peter directly, thou art also of them. In the Matthew version, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. So he's kind of getting ganged up on, and other people are now in on this, and now all eyes are on Peter, and he's feeling really uncomfortable. In Mark 14, verse 70, he denied it again. In fact, Matthew's version says he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. Okay, fine, two denials, but I'd never do it a third time. And yeah, I guess this time I did say I didn't know him. But that doesn't mean I denied who he is. I know who he is. He is the Christ, the Son of the, of the eternal God. And what do I do? Why did I come this close? Why not, when I left to go to the porch, why didn't I leave to go back to Bethany or back to an upper room somewhere or rally the troops and join with the other apostles. What, what am I doing here? No, I've got to stay to the end. I've got to see this thing through. I, if Jesus gets out of, the, out of here, I want to be here to help. So what do we do next? Verse 70. And a little after, Luke gets more specific about the space of one hour after. So again, maybe he's feeling a little safer. They that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. In Matthew's version, it says, Thy speech bereath thee. In other words, we can tell by your accent. It's like, I'm not from the South. What y'all talking about? It's like, uh, uh, I really do think you're from the South. Uh, you sound like a Galilean. And Jesus of Nazareth, that's the Galilee. You don't sound like a city slicker among the Judeans here in Jerusalem. You're an outsider, and chances are you're one of them. You're one of his. 
In fact, there's a lot more confidence now. Now they have more evidence, the accent. They're more sure of themselves. Surely thou art one of them. In fact, in the Luke version, it says they confidently affirmed, saying, of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. Now, you see what Peter's up against? In some ways, yeah, to deny to some servant girl when no one else is looking on, uh, whatever. Uh, that would have been a better time, though, to kind of come to your senses and go, I got to get out of here, or I am going to cross the line ultimately. It's like, oh, no, like Samson, again, I can handle lions. I can tear them apart with my own hands. And he puts himself back in harm's way. That's fine. I can get out of this one. And he tears off the city gates and marches away from the Philistine army. Okay, fine. Put yourself back in harm's way. But eventually he came up against a temptation he could not resist. And that was Delilah. In Peter's case, eventually he got to a point where you're... You can't handle this one. And you should have resisted earlier and got out of the situation. But now, when there's evidence against you and people are confidently affirming, surely we know now of a truth, what's he going to do? By the way, in John's version, this time, this third time, it was no random servant neither maid nor man, nor no-namer. This was one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off. And he said, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? I mean, yikes, now we've got an eyewitness. I was there. You seem to be awfully close to the fray. In fact, you, you look familiar. I... <sighs> A, a, a near kinsman of mine ended up getting his, I mean, it was crazy scene. I, I, you would have remembered. In fact, I'm pretty sure I remember you. Uh, I, I should bring my, my kinsman back. Uh, he was going to be at the hospital, but he's not. He's, he had an ear issue, but he's totally fine now. Crazy how that happened. But I wonder if he would recognize you. Now, can you picture Peter swallowing hard, like gulp, like I'm, I'm dead. We've got the ultimate eyewitness now. It, uh, not just my accent. This guy recognizes my face. And he's calling me out. So what's Peter to do? Mark 14, 71 and 72. He began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And the second time the cock crew. Matthew says that the cock crew immediately. And Luke adds, while he yet spake. So you want to talk about a well-trained rooster. Right on cue, as soon as the third denial came from his lips, the second alarm sounded. And Peter realized what he'd done. It says that Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him. And what were those words? Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. You probably just heard it in Jesus' own voice, ringing through his ears. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Matthew's version is the more famous phrase. He went out and wept bitterly. And if that's Mark and Matthew, Luke includes the most painful detail of all. It says that the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Can you imagine that? Eyes bearing into the soul. You've had all kinds of eyes on you the last few hours. As people keep staring at you, wondering, trying to put two and two together. Where, where have I seen that guy? He speaks up to defend himself. Oh, he sounds like, I wonder if... The, guys, guys, come here. Anyone? No? I'm sure... And he swears and he curses and he's like, how can I be more obvious that I have nothing to do with this situation? And as soon as he said it the third time, the cock crows and, and Jesus looks. At this moment when he said it, was he looking in at Jesus? Kind of through the open columns and 
was he watching Jesus being slapped and buffeted and spat upon and Jesus doing nothing to defend himself? As he looks in there to see it, Jesus, in the midst of all of this, times his turn perfectly. And with the sound of the rooster still echoing off the columns, he turns and looks at Peter and eye contact and a flood of memories. I said I'd go to prison with him. Here I am at the palace. I said I'd go to the grave with him. I told him that everyone else might be scattered, but not me. That others, lesser apostles, would be offended, but not your rock. I, I promised. I, but then to look, to see, to make eye contact, and to see disappointment. Not an I told you so on the part of the Lord, but just a look. Was it disappointment? Was it, was it sorrow? Was it sadness? Was it a look of encouragement? Was Jesus looking at Simon or was it looking at Peter? I don't know. Who, who was the chief apostle at this moment? Was he weak? Was he strong? Was he both of the above? Aren't we all? No wonder Peter weeps. And those are bitter tears to match the Savior's bitter cup. Oh, there's so much that we can talk about here. In John's version of all of this, the story ends. Chapter 18, verse 28. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Again, straining out a gnat, swallowing a camel. I mean, we can't be caught in Roman territory. We don't want to go into the hall of judgment. I mean, technically, Law of Moses says you're not supposed to even hold trials during festivals and feasts. Those are supposed to be times of rejoicing and commemorating God, not condemning our fellow man. This whole thing we've been doing under cover of darkness, we don't want to, this to meet the light of day. Well, it didn't work to condemn him on, in the, the Jewish court. Let's send him off to the Roman court and let Pilate do our, do our dirty work. I mean, technically, we can't execute anyone anyway. The Romans are going to have to do it, so sooner or later it's got to go to him. So let's send him to the Roman side of things. But we're not going to follow because, I mean, it is a, fa a, fa a feast day, and I don't want to defile myself. I mean, I've got to keep myself clean for Passover. Oh, how's the camel taste Caiaphas. But here we see the shift from night to day, from Caiaphas to Pilate, from Jewish authorities to Roman authorities, and from charges of blasphemy to charges of treason. We are shifting from Gethsemane to Calvary, from atonement to crucifixion. And that's where we'll pick up next week. I hope you'll come back for more. There's so much we need to talk about as Jesus comes to the cross. But to finish this week, in this moment, to kind of freeze frame and pause with tears flowing down Simon Peter's cheeks, recognizing their bitterness, but wondering what lies behind them. For this, again, it's worthwhile to go back to President Kimball and let him talk about his brother, Peter. Now, it's, it's President or Elder Kimball's hope to explain what might have been going on in Peter's mind, although he admits he doesn't know for sure. None of us can. But he does say this, much of the criticism of Simon Peter is centered in his denial of his acquaintance with the master. This has been labeled cowardice. Remember that whole list of things that that other Protestant minister had thrown at, at, at Simon's face. But President Elder Kimball says, are we sure of his motive in that recorded denial? 
He had already given up his occupation and placed all worldly goods on the altar for the cause. If we admit that he was cowardly and denied the Lord through timidity, can we still find a great lesson? Has anyone more completely overcome mortal selfishness and weakness? Has anyone repented more sincerely? Peter has been accused of being harsh, indiscreet, impetuous, fearful. If all these things were true, then we still ask, has any man ever more completely triumphed over his weaknesses? And again, we will see <laughs> triumph in the book of Acts. We will see a full-fledged rock-like Peter leading the fledgling church. No fear ever in his face. Here, is there still fear? Is there still weakness? Yes, but is it the weakness that people accuse him of? Because President Kim or Elder Kimball goes on. He says, is it possible that there might have been some other reason for Peter's triple denial? Could he have felt that circumstances justified expediency? When he bore a strong testimony in Caesarea Philippi, and we've referred to that already, he had been told that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So think about that. And Jesus has been saying that repeatedly. Keep the messianic secret. So is Peter wondering, is now not the time to speak up in his defense? I mean, what had he just seen Jesus do in the garden? It, when he first said, I'll never deny you, and Jesus said, oh, you'll deny me three times before the end of the night, that was a different set of circumstances. I didn't think the end was here. You kept suggesting that, yeah, it's here, but it's never really here, is it? You always get out of these kinds of, of, these kinds of situations. And I was going to see to it that this was another one you got out of and lived to tell the day, to tell the tale. But then I saw, I mean, why do you think I drew a sword in Gethsemane? If I'm willing to face an army, you don't think I'm willing to face a, a maid and some servant? I don't care if I am right outside Caiaphas' palace. I still got my sword handy. Now, if this is the same Peter that was bold enough to fight for Jesus, I assume that that hasn't changed. His personality hasn't some, suddenly switched to the opposite extreme in a couple of hours. But I wonder if his understanding has deepened and realized, maybe this one really is the end. Because Jesus did go as a lamb to the slaughter. I mean, I... I'm still trying to wrap my head around this. He told us to bring swords, and then he refused to let us use them. And then I went and watched, and he didn't defend himself before Annas or Caiaphas. He didn't raise a finger to stop the beating he was taking. Lamb to the slaughter. Maybe Isaiah's time has come to be fulfilled. In which case, what am I supposed to do? Go with them to the grave? Then where will that leave the fledgling church? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Now, some people misquote Elder Kimball and say that Jesus was commanding Peter to deny him. When he said, this night thou shalt deny me thrice. Ooh, is that a thou shalt in terms of commandment or a you will in terms of prophecy? Was he telling Peter, you've got to deny me because you have to outlive me. And having me die tonight or tomorrow and you die right alongside me. Oh, I'll have two thieves beside me. I don't want a chief apostle next door. You've got to live. And in order to do that, you're going to have to swallow hard and deny that you're connected to me. No matter how much every piece of your bold personality wants to jump back into a fight. No, thou shalt. Now, some people say that's what President Kimball was suggesting. It isn't. He wasn't putting those words in Jesus' mouth. But he was trying to explain other possibilities for Peter. And maybe the thought of I, I, some of those thoughts may have come into Peter's mind. Not that Jesus was commanding me to do it, but rather, I have to. There's no other way. 
were these bitter tears of recognizing weakness or, or admitting weakness or were they bitter tears of recognizing responsibility? And I, I can't, I have, what am I supposed to do? And caught between a rock and a hard place, the rock and the ultimate hard place to be. I, I swear, I curse. I'm not with him, at least not right now, where I wish I could be. I don't know him, at least not the way the world has to know him. I swear I will be converted, fully changed by him, but I have to live long enough for him to make those changes. But once transformed, you better believe I'll strengthen my brethren. You better believe I'll follow him to the grave. I will be his rock. But today that means saying, I'm not. When down deep, I know I am. That seems to be what Elder Kimball is suggesting. He says, this was a critical moment. Peter's act of protection with his sword slashing had been after this prediction was made. He had tried. He had seen one apostle betray his master with a kiss, and his master had not repulsed him. Peter had been reminded that angels could be summoned if protection was needed. He had been commanded to put away his sword. Even now he did not desert his master, but followed sorrowfully behind the jeering crowd. He would remain to the end. He likely heard every accusation, saw every indignity heaped upon his Lord, felt all the injustice of the mock trial, and noted the perfidy of false witnesses perjuring their souls. He saw them foully expectorate in the face of the Holy One. He saw them buffet, strike, slap, and taunt him. He observed the Lord making no resistance, calling for no protective legions of angels, asking for no mercy. What was Peter to think now? Elder Kimball admitted, I do not pretend to know what Peter's mental reactions were, nor what compelled him to say what he did that terrible night. But in light of his proven bravery, courage, great devotion, and limitless love for the Master, could we not give him the benefit of the doubt and at least forgive him as his Savior seems to have done so fully? Almost immediately, Christ elevated him to the highest position in his church and endowed him with the complete keys of that kingdom. So where does that leave us? What does Elder Kimball conclude? Simon Barjona did not have long to consider the matter or change his decisions, for he now heard the cock crow twice and was reminded of Christ's prediction. He was humbled to the dust. Hearing the bird's announcement of the dawn reminded him not only that he had denied the Lord, but also that all the Lord had said would be fulfilled, even to the crucifixion. He went out and wept bitterly. Were his tears for personal repentance only, or were they mingled with sorrowful tears in realization of the fate of his Lord and Master and his own great loss? I do love what Elder Kimball is saying there. Whether it was weakness or strength, or most likely a combination of the two, yes, I see myself in Simon but hope someday to see myself in Peter. I, I can't wait to see his ministry unfold in the book of Acts and in his epistles. He's a new, transformed, fully converted soul that Jesus trusted, that trusted the, king, the keys of the kingdom to. That should give us hope. that in our denials of the divinity within us, there is hope for repentance. And I pray that when we do not live up to the Lord's expectations, and when we succumb to the natural man or woman, or woman within, I hope we'll have the courage to look into the courtyard and see Jesus looking out at us still bearing the blood stains, 
that taught him what it's like to be weak. That taught him to empathize with perfect understanding why we're not as strong as we need to be. Please keep in mind what Jesus had just done for Peter and for all of us in the garden. And it's back in that garden I'd like to end. I spent so much time there when I was a student studying abroad in Israel. It seemed like on the Sabbath we always had extra free time, and it's a quick walk from the Jerusalem Center on the Mount of Olives, Mount Scopus technically, but it's part of the range, the Mount of Olives. A quick walk down the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. There's a part that is more touristy, a chapel, the Church of All Nations right there. It's beautiful, but crowded. And then across the little dirt road is an enclosed garden that somehow the owners always took pity on <laughs> BYU students and always let us in. And I had so many hours spent in the garden, especially on Holy Sabbaths, to just ponder, to pray, to study my scriptures, to listen to the entire garden oratorio from Michael McLean and Bryce Newbert, Merrill Jensen. I've talked to you about that before. But just time spent there, trying to understand what Jesus went through in that sacred space for me. Recently, I stumbled across a poem by Darlene Young, who's an English professor at BYU great gifted talent, and she wrote a poem about Gethsemane that in very few words describes something so beautiful as far as what the Savior was going through. She wrote, Oh, how is a human to comprehend godly heartbreak? Might as well teach a point on a line about temples and spires, about stars. It's a matter of dimension, impossible geometry. What we know. He went to a place. He knew that ahead of him was a pain yet unknown in the world, extra dimensional. That seeing it, he who had maybe never known fear before this asked to be excused, but not really. We know the contemplation of that pain was so terrible it required the ministration of an angel before it could be approached. We know. At point zero, he was left alone in a way no human can comprehend. We know he came out on the other side, gentle, generous, quieter. Forever after, he would say very little about it. Only shrink. Only nevertheless. In some ways, it's that last word, nevertheless. It needs to echo in our ears and sound within our souls for the rest of eternity. That the mortal side of Jesus wanted to shrink, but the divine side would not let him. And so nevertheless was his watchword. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's a word we have to add to our vocabulary. That we have to engrave it into the fleshy tables of our heart so that any time our will rises against the Lord's, we can answer it with a never the less. To do so, I think we'll need to spend more time in Gethsemane. That we need to be drawn there and go oft times, as was said of Jesus. One of those times the oft times that I went to Jerusalem, or excuse me, that I went to Gethsemane when I was in Jerusalem, I was there on a day when a bunch of LDS tours, I guess, happened to be in town. And as I was sitting there for the, I don't know, second or third hour in the garden, the gate opened and they let in another group of Latter-day Saint tourists. I could tell they were tourists because I could hear their tour guide explain to them a little bit about Gethsemane uh, give the, the tourist spiel. Uh, it's better than that. That doesn't do it justice. But 
explain what the garden meant. Spend a few minutes describing the atonement that took place there. And then saying to the, to the assembled tourists, and this is the part that broke my heart. The tour guide said, I'm sure you would all want some personal time here. So please feel free to take it. But please be back on the bus in five minutes because we got to get on to our next site. And when he said five minutes, my heart broke because I'd already been there for hours. And I'd been there the Sabbath before and I'd probably come back again the Sabbath after. And I just thought, how do you squeeze eternity into five minutes? Well, in a way, Jesus did. It would have been hours between coming up for air and going back to the disciples, but to squeeze the infinite and the eternal into finite time and sacred space. I don't know what they did for those five minutes, but I knew it forced me to take my hours a little more seriously. To not take them for granted, but to understand what a gift it was that Jesus had given me in Gethsemane. In fact, before I left Jerusalem, my dad sent me a letter. And in it he said, you know, son, I'm jealous. I may never get to Jerusalem. And because of that, would you please go and spend some time in Gethsemane for me? I'll always remember those words. And so sure enough, in one of my last Sabbaths, I went back to Gethsemane and just spent some time there for my father. In some ways, that's what Jesus did for us all. He spent some time in Gethsemane for all of us. And he spent some time in Gethsemane for his father too, because it was his father's will that he suffer there. To drink the bitter cup, not to shrink, which is exactly what Jesus did. I bear solemn testimony of what took place there in the garden. I testify because of personal experience that guilt can be swept away, can be washed down the Kidron River through the blood of Jesus. I bear witness of him humbly and gratefully. I testify that he spent time in Gethsemane, not just for all of us collectively, but for you individually. And, as I, and I pray that as a result of that time spent for us, we will spend some time there for him, coming to know the Lord of life as he approached the doors of death. The garden awaits, my friends, and if you'll come there, you will find Jesus. <laughs>